Hello, and good morning to you from where I am in Ashlandia. And I am happy to be doing this with you. And I'm an 80 year old woman speaking of what it is to be alive for me. So here we go. I'm Lavelle Fus. <laughs> and um, I've been asked to talk about my experience as a woman. And I'm grateful for that. The tone of who we are and the estrogen of who we are and the depth of the birthing possibilities that we have births in many different ways. And for me, birthing a human being wasn't the form I took. And I knew the vision and the dreams I wanted to go for as I moved along in life. And then I have had an opportunity to live them. And to live all of the dreams that I've had. And that's a pretty remarkable opportunity. And so I, I come to you this day in the cold of winter with the sunshine to share a bit of that. The beginnings of knowing the womanness of myself and unfolding that started to take place when I decided to be a teacher. And I taught uh, junior high and high school. I was teaching at uh, Los Alamitos High School in California during the John Birch times. And uh, I, I wanted to say too that I'm 80 years old. And it's real important for uh, me to say that so that you have a perspective of what you're looking, who you're looking at now, to who I was when I was looking, when I was looking like this. So you see how youth and time take its toll. And I would say that being the age that I am, I am came into me one morning to honor the fact that I am now an old woman, an older woman, and hopefully before I leave here I have the gift of being an elder. They don't necessarily go together, maybe. So I need and label myself except the truth of my age on the physical plane. So I started at, at Los Alamitos High School. And I bring this up because it was when I was in my early 20s, so the passion of being alive and the desire of creativity, I was speaking speech and drama and communications. So it was a daily demand school and I could, flexible scheduling. So students could come in and we could, uh, they could do or schedule in when they wanted to. It was a public school, but doing the drama and, and the, we did 60 productions in one year. Now this means that I had a big enough room that we could flex students in during the day. So students, other students, could do their pieces for everybody that wanted to come during different schedulings. And I was living at the beach. It was beautiful. I was friends with my students because I'm in my 20s. What do I know about being an adult? Luckily, not very much. <laughs> and so I, I had a lot of time with my students and I went to the Big Sur Folk Festival at Esalen. And that was remarkable, being there with Joan Baez and uh, Crosby, Stills, and Nash, and John Sebastian, and being at Esalen, where it was at, <clears throat> and having all that input, and having all the input in those, those years in the 1970s, the no, late 60s, the late 60s, with Ram Dass, Paramahansa Yogananda, the Tibetan Book of the Dead, and, and the psychedelics and the gift that marijuana was for some and not for others. The gifts that psychedelics were some known and not for others. But the influence those things had on the cultural contacts of, of Martin Luther King and 
you know. <laughs> and if you don't, you're hearing about it. <laughs> so I was gifted with incredible opportunity and desire. And then when I was 29, I knew that I wanted to move back to the country, to the land, because of the input that I had in the, with all of nature and living at the beach and the consciousness. And um, I didn't know for sure what that meant. And then, then I found Ashlyn through a wonderful dear friend who decided that it was important that uh, that she move here. And I thought, well, she's a wonderful person in my life and that seems like a good place. So I journeyed with her here and it seemed like exactly right. And that was 1970, okay? Are you with me, whatever age you are? So when you look at elders now, you're looking at you as a younger person deciding who to be because we all were doing that. And so being here was a chance to unfold as an artist. So I'm coming to you in this video, or film, however it's called nowadays, as an artist, as a social transformer, worker, person, a woman, and as a human being with a story that I hope keeps inspiration alive in each and one of us who are watching this. And if you look at some of these photos of, uh, and pictures of what I have done and my website, lavellefoos.com, it will inspire you to trust yourself and know that visions can be real, but it has to be because it's from your deep self and not too much from the ego of, I'm so bitchin', you know. I mean, you know, I did plenty of that, I'm bitching. Well, now it's like I'm looking back and going, I'm glad I had the, the energy to do this stuff. And, and I'm glad I know the people and have given love and received the love. Now, what's important about that whole introduction expression is where I landed and what that has brought. That was all that energy that I began this with that got me here. <laughs> and now we're here. And so, and that being here meant, I moved here in 1970. This is the history and the history of Ashlandia. Ashland was a very small town. It's always been a spiritual center in its own way even though it housed Ku Klux Klan via Medford for quite a while early on. It held the hot springs. The First Nation people used the creek. Salmon came up that creek. And uh, we were the first, I guess, major influx of hippies or alternative culture people. And I moved here in a big tr truck, a old Wonder Bread school truck that I fixed up into a beautiful May van living van inside. And those of us that I was associated with, a lot of them were, had been professionals be, in their journey to here. Dennis and uh, company owners that weren't doing any of that anymore, that were, that were really wanting to be somewhere that they could participate in community. So the influx went here and it went out to, out to, Grants Pass and past that where a lot of the earth, the earth based, real earth based women and men were living. They were called hippies then and they were in the country that way. And then there was a lot of the women who owned and were buying land and were being women on the land. And I had those women as my friends besides the women that, of us who lived in town. Now I was living on what was called, is called Oak Street. Now, Ashland's a really, a really grown community you can imagine in 40 and 50 years. Oak Street was a dirt road. Hersey was a dirt road. Mountain was a dirt road. And I lived on the dirt road of Oak Street in a barn with a servant's quarters next to it that had been part of the main estate. 
So I was gifted, without the long story of it, or bought this big barn with the blacksmith shop, the little house next to it, and one of the people that I had done some work with built a fun, interesting shaped building on top of those two on this dirt road. Now for some reason, and I promise you, it's a soulful unknown except by the nature of it seeing it happen in my life. People started coming to visit me <laughs> or needing a place to live for maybe two months or three months or whatever. And it didn't seem like, please don't get it mixed up with people. It, it, it got formed with people who were really needing to find their way and wanting to find a place to land and start a life in a way that served them instead of the city and this big it. So we started building little places on the side or off the barn and they could live there for a month or two for like $25 a month and Dennis DeBay, who's a famous, infamous blacksmith now, lived upstairs in one of the in the house, and he he uh, he had a big wood burning stove because he's a blacksmith that I had in the big barn studio. And people started to stay, and I have to say, of the hundred people, it was really more than that, but you'll think I'm exaggerating. <laughs> the hundred people that lived there over a 15 year period. I didn't ask anybody but two people to move. There were men, different men and, and women. And everybody took care. And yes, it was not a commune. I didn't, this, I, I don't live in that format. And I was reasonable and kind and there was nothing I had to do to enforce anything. So there was that gift as part of it. Having this land come to me, having people come and live there, you know, maybe there would be as, as much as about 10 at a time with the facilities that were there. And that's when I started being an artist with wood. And so you're going to be shown these images. I was starting with smaller wood. So I started doing the wood carving. There was a friend who lived there that uh, had some wood carving tools, some chisels and mallets. And I just started and playing around with them. And these beautiful things were coming out of me like a walking cane and a wall piece. And I did everything by hand. There was no power tools. And then I started doing big signs for downtown. And then I started, I went to the coast and on the way there's a Jedediah Smith. There's a place that has all this wood. And they had giant slabs of redwood that were like three and four feet wide and 10 feet long. And I had stopped and I, now I was really full of what I could be, what I could do. And so we, I stopped and I had my pickup. And um, I had them put three of the large three feet by eight feet redwood slabs in the back of the truck. I mean, that's how much energy. I mean, I don't even have testosterone. <laughs> and I'm not a big body. I mean, I was into all the, you know, the rightful eating, you know, <laughs> stuff. And uh, started carving these large pieces, which you will see, um, out of ancient redwood struck down by lightning. This is out of that 2,000-year-old redwood that's struck down by lightning. And uh, 
you'll see the picture where this is not all turned black, but no matter what you put on something, if it's outside and it's wood, it's going to turn. And this is a, this was done like a 40, 30 or 40 years ago, 30 years ago. So it's been outside a lot and in different, different sculpture parks. And then they wouldn't take it anymore because it wasn't like shiny. So as you notice now, the parks will all have them. Um, the shiny things and no more wood. <laughs> Creation. The waves of time and space. Amethyst crystal is at the bottom. And this one. This is the Tibetan turquoise. Women wore for the practice of compassion and remembering the earth. The crystal, the amber. go into how this whole women's, this whole transformational energy field of the estrogen moving in women and the spirit of creation helping unfold who we are as women on this planet in a cloistered enough environment that wasn't separatist in its living space, its community, and start really owning and breathing and singing our wonder. And there were country women who had land that they were living in cottages and sharing what it was to be in community that way. And they would come to town and my barn was big enough to have gatherings there and a place called Positively 4th Street where women's theater could be put on, and women's concerts. So we could hear, what do we sound like? What is our tone? What does it feel like to have sisters? And feel that bond, and have music created by us? And women's gatherings, Michigan's Women Festival, it went for years. Ashland, we did a women's gathering for 20 some years at Lake of the Woods. Women of, of all tonals of their choices in life. We've got, had a big mother drum made because early then in First Nation, from my understanding, women were not encouraged to play the drum. It was the man's instrument. So I wanted a big drum for us, and so did some of the other women. We went in on a community pay buying, and a wonderful man named Randy made us a big mother drum, this big. And six can play it or more at a time, and it had a stand built. And that was how we opened and did our gathering with drumming. And I was... This is a, been a lots of places in Canada. When women were 
drummers. Six at a time, pass the hollow, pass the mallet. Hear yourself make the sound. Rhythm. The rhythms of creation. And so it is. And I was being a musician with four other women, with guitar and drums and flutes, and writing our own songs, I mean, not, and just improvisationally doing it with mel melodies we knew that we made up. And at the gathering, we would have, be doing our own music, sound system set up, and then some just out by the trees. And then the Oregon's Women's Festival was taking place. And that carried on. By 1970, a women's gathering started in northern, uh, started in Canada. Now we've had the the Washington's Women's Festival. 150, 200 women came to that, and then that shifted, and so some of us from the states and Canada got together and created a cross crossbound, cross-border women's festival on in Vancouver on um, Vancouver Island at Lake Cowichan. Now what's so wonderful about this is that it gave women a chance from all walks of life to come together for five to seven days in nature, in nice little cottages with nice food being made for us, do workshops and music, and with the, the uh, Native American flute and the big drum, in the morning I would play the, Kathy would play the big boom boom on the big drum, and I would play the low tone flutes into a reverb and echo with the lake cowichan behind me and the trees, the evergreens, and the ravens flying over, and women coming out of their cabins with their shawls on, and I was back in time. So the essence of the women's circles and community was taking place. And that was just in the last 20 years up to now. So I guess I was 60 when I was doing that up to 80. Well, I stopped at 75 because I had to. But it went five more years from women being young to elders. Now, the gatherings are starting up again with young women here. And women now have a way to find each other in community because we're knowing how to talk to each other without just thinking that, well, I'm in that clique and you're in that clique of men and women, women, women. Older people, you know, I mean, I'm an elder or an older woman. And now the people who are my age then or this age now. So, whoa. Our history went from Perry Como to Bob Dylan, you know? So, um, now there is a beautiful blending and men and women are finding ways of, I think, finding more integration because I'm trusting that we as women have had a chance to bring more self-worth in. I came in as an only child and my mother was a grand format for letting me be me. And from somehow getting that from her to do, to do my dreams. And it's been encouraged in my life. And I hope this lets men and women because all of us need to trust that it's just not our hormones alone that cause us or let us or give us the we of us. It's our soul being willing to be discovered. 
That's 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 what I know right now.